Okay, speaking of starting, it's time to get started. Um, we're going to talk about more lenses, optics, things today. Remember, in the lab lecture, I didn't actually go through the mechanism for the lens other than what I had shown you in class about prisms. So, or Actually, maybe I did that during lab. Anyway, <clears throat> when light goes from one material to another, the speed can change. Now, the frequency cannot change. Important rule. Frequency for a wave cannot change. So, when light is in air, it has its fastest possible speed. Actually, vacuum is truly the fastest possible speed, but air is really similar. But when it goes from air into something else, like water, it slows down. If the frequency stays the same and the speed slows down, what has to happen to the wavelength? You have frequency times the wavelength is equal to speed. If frequency stays the same but the speed slows down, what has to happen to the wavelength? This goes down. What does that have to? It's going to have to go down as well. Oops, I did it the wrong way. Well, no, I did it the right way. So the wavelength has to get shorter when it goes from air into water. If it goes from water into air, then you're going something faster. What's going to happen to the wavelength? It's going to get longer. So the wavelengths change from one medium to another. This actually brings up an interesting thing about colors. We talked about colors, and I said that about 750 nanometers wavelength was red, and about 400 nanometers wavelength was blue. But if the wavelength changes by material, I really have to specify in what material I was giving those wavelengths. Well, what material do you suppose those wavelengths were given in? In air, yeah. So, in our eyeball, we're going through essentially water. The last thing before the retina was that vitreous humor, which is essentially the same as water. It has the same speed as water. So, the wavelengths actually, when they get to our rods and cones, are not the wavelengths we quote. But the frequencies are still the frequencies we quote, because the frequencies can't change. If it's blue light, it's going to have approximately four times 10 to the 14th hertz, regardless of what medium it's in. So we talk about this thing we call the index of refraction that tells us about how the speed changes. And notice this, this definition seems odd. The index of refraction is C. Do you remember what C stood for? It's up there, I know, but it's the speed of light in vacuum. So it, the index refraction is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in whatever medium we're in. So we could say, for instance, for water, N for water is 1.33. How fast does light travel through water? Give me an equation. That is a true statement. It's frequency times wavelength. But just based on this equation here that defines n, the index refraction, how can I find the speed? C That's right. All I have to do is flip the positions of those two, multiply both sides by v, divide both sides by n, so it's going to be the speed of light in vacuum divided by 1.33. Now 1.33, that's just 4 thirds. So 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by 4 thirds is going to be 9 over 4. 9 over 4 is 2.25. So 2.25 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's how fast light goes through water. 
Now, a lot of people know diamonds. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, according to the, uh, the advertisements. What they are is a monopoly, a worldwide monopoly's best friend. Diamond has its special properties because... The index refraction of diamond is 2.42. What does that immediately suggest to you about diamond? It refracts more than water. Okay. It refracts more than water, although I haven't actually talked about the refraction yet, but that is correct identification. What about its speed? It's going to go down, and with that big index refraction, it's going to have a relatively slow speed. Now, notice I said relatively. It's obviously a lot faster than you can run. So if you take 3 times 10 to the 8 and you divide it by 2.42, that's going to give you something that's a little bit above 1 times 10 to the 8. Um, my, for some reason, my... Swipe to bring up the calendar just doesn't work anymore. So I don't know what that number is. Somebody have a yeah? Do you have a calculator there, uh, Zach? Can you calculate for me. Yeah. Thank you. Three six? So I said. Okay, so three seven then. Times ten to the eight meters per second. So the speed of light going through diamond that's really slow compared to the speed of light. Compared to most things, it's really fast. But that slow speed in diamond is what gives it its interesting properties that makes it, you know, sparkle. Here's another thing that happens when light goes from one material to another. This is where we have the actual word refraction. Refraction means bending when light goes from one material into another. And that bending occurs solely because the speed is changed. I'm from California. I like to go to Huntington Beach to visit my sister as much as I can. And when you're there at the beach, you know, you can run on the sidewalk or you could step off that sidewalk and run in the loose sand. Of course, it's harder to run in the loose sand. And so people naturally slow down when they go from the sidewalk to the sand. Or the same would be true if you were riding a bicycle. If you go from the sidewalk into the sand, you're going to slow down a lot. So since you slow down a lot, what do you suppose a lot of us have ridden bicycles and done things like this? You're riding on the sidewalk and then you turn off into sand. What happens to your direction when you get into that sand? You veer off away from the sidewalk, right? And that's a natural response of going into something with a different speed. If you imagine going to the beach, you go down to Zach's and you get one of those little uh, four-wheeled carts that you pedal. You guys know what I'm talking about? Those would be the perfect example. If you have a bad steer and they drive and the tires drop into the sand, that side's going to be pulled by the sand and slowed down. The other side goes faster and it will turn facing toward the sand. That's what light does because of exactly that same principle. And the amount it turns depends on how much slower the speed was. So this diagram actually shows I have light coming in with a wavelength here. That's supposed to be a lambda. Let me draw the lambda first. A wavelength here between the two wave fronts goes into water, and in water, the wavelength gets shorter. 
And so the spacing gets shorter and it has to change directions to have the new wavelength. And now I'm going to show you here the correct equation. On the next slide, there's an approximation. The correct equation for calculating how much the light is going to bend is just based on using geometry. It's called Snell's Law. And it says N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Now let's make sure we understand what the things in this equation mean. So what is N1? What did N stand for? Index of refraction. Index refraction. So N1 is the index of refraction in medium 1. That is the medium that the light was originally in. What about theta 1? Okay, I'm going to give it a name we've already used. Not for this symbol, but angle of incidence. What did the word incidence mean? Right. Incidence was coming in. So that theta 1 was the angle of incidence. It was the angle of the light in medium 1. But really, really important to use in this equation is how do you measure that angle of incidence? Same as I talked about on Monday. I remember I lectured on Monday, right? It was a thing. Yeah. I talked about having the surface and the normal direction to the surface. And we measure our angles from the surface normal. And so this angle of incidence is measured from the normal to the surface. It's really important that you remember that or you won't get the right answers using this equation. Now I did it. <laughs> the left side of the equal side, the right side of the equal side, what's the only difference? The subscript. That's all that matters, or all that changes. So the index refraction in medium 1 times the sine of the angle of incidence is equal to the index refraction in medium 2 times the sine of the angle of, we call this one refraction, because the light refracted. What did refract mean? means it bends when it goes from one material into another. That's what refraction meant. So our angle of refraction is the angle that it has from the normal once it has refracted. And really important things to remember on this, if you go into a material with a slower speed, which means a higher index refraction, it will refract toward the normal. It's going to move, notice, Here's the straight direction, and it moved toward the normal from that. If you go from a slower speed into a faster speed, light works the same way forward and backward. So it actually refracts away from the normal if you go from a slower speed to a faster speed material. So here is the same equation, but for small angles only. So this is specific to small angles. I never use this except for with the example right here. 
of looking at how deep something appears below water. When you look at something in water, like I talked about on Monday, you look at somebody who's standing in water, looks like their legs are shorter and at a different angle. Those are both because of the bending of light. And so using this equation, we can actually relate the distance or the depth of the object to the depth of the image. And it's just using trigonometry, using that small angle equation, the actual depth, O, actual depth, actual, multiplied by the ratio of the two indices of refraction gives me the apparent depth. So taking a simple situation like air and water, let's suppose that this fish was a distance of three meters below the surface of the water. It's actually pretty deep to be able to see the fish, but it's a nice easy number. So if that fish is three meters below the surface of the water, and I want to know how deep it appears, I'll just put my numbers in. So I'm going to have I is equal to three meters, N2. Since the object started in the water, N1, the first medium, was the water. So N2, what is N2 in this picture? It's what? Air. And so I'm going to have on top the index refraction for air, and what is the index refraction for air? Don't remember? It's... The index refraction is the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the medium. And air has essentially the same speed as in vacuum, and so it's just one. It's actually more like 1.000, and then there's digits that aren't zero. So to three significant digits, we can just put one. For water, the index refraction is essentially four-thirds. And so this is just like a calculation we did. 3 divided by 4 thirds is 9 fourths, or 2.25 meters. So that's how we can calculate how deep it actually appears based on the material. If you take something like a diamond, the diamond you're going to be dividing by 2.42, things will appear much less deep. So if you're looking from the front of a diamond, it looks like the diamond is much smaller in depth than it actually is. Okay, now we have our clicker question, number one. Okay, probably is going to work better to see the question. If you're standing on a bridge over stream, looking down on a fish, and it's one meter below the surface, what's the apparent location of the fish to you? All right, we had zero, two, five, one, one. All right, who would like to explain that the correct answer was the one that got the majority here? Who would like to explain how you got that answer? Five, you got it. I only know for sure two people. I know Michaela and Rachel got it right. Which is good. I don't know everyone else. I know people got involved too. That like that would be inappropriate. Okay. Well, let's go with Michaela. How did you get your answer? Uh, 
Rachel, how'd you get your answer? Okay, so she said the water index refraction is 1.33. That's smaller than 2. And so how did that lead you to your correct answer then? Because it wouldn't be half of a meter. It wouldn't be 1 meter where it actually is because of the refraction. And it's not going to be more than what it is. Okay, very perfect logic. She said, okay. It would have had to have an index refraction that's twice as big for it to be a half meter below the surface. Of course, it's not going to appear above the surface. As awesome as that would be, that's not what's going to happen. It's not going to appear deeper because the water has a bigger index refraction. And it's not going to appear the same. So just logically, it has to be the only one that's between the same and the one that would have an index refraction of two. Doing it mathematically, you would just do what we did a moment ago, except for you have one meter instead of three meters. So it was N2, one on top. Well, this time it has 1.33, so I'd better put the 1.33. Obviously, if you look at the answer, they put in four thirds, because if you divide by four thirds, that's three quarters, which is 0.75. Now something that's really kind of fun. You saw when I was playing with the prism up here that I can have reflections on the inside. That reflection on the inside is what we call total internal reflection. Internal because the light didn't leave, it stayed inside of the material. Total internal reflection can only occur in a specific situation. You have to have N2 is less than N1. That means you're going into a medium where light travels faster. If you're going to a medium the light travels slower, it always bends toward the normal and you can never have total internal reflection. But if you're going into a medium where light travels faster, for instance, going from plexiglass into air, plexiglass has an index refraction that's really close to one and a half, Air has an index refraction of 1. If you're going from plexiglass into air, then the light is going to refract away from the normal. That's what it's showing here in the first picture. There's my angle of incidence. There's my angle of refraction. And you see the angle of refraction is bigger. It bent away from the normal. Well, in that case, if I make the angle of incidence bigger, I can get to the point where the angle refraction is 1, or not 1, is 90 degrees. So if we look at our equation, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2. If we get to the situation where sine theta 2 is equal to 1, that's the maximum you can have for refraction. That gives you theta 2 is equal to 90 degrees, which means that the light just travels parallel to the interface between the two surfaces. Sine theta can't go bigger than 1. That's the biggest it can get. This equation, Snell's law, n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, it doesn't work if you have a bigger angle of incidence than the angle that's shown right here. So we call the angle of incidence where sine theta 2 is equal to 1 the critical angle. And so let's solve this for the critical angle. First, I'll divide both sides by n1 to move it across. So I'll have sine of theta critical is equal to n2 over n1 times 1. Because at the critical angle, sine theta 2 is just 1. 
And then finally, to get theta by itself, this might be, I don't know, one of the more sophisticated math things we do in this class. It's not that tough. We have to do the inverse sine of both sides. If you do the inverse sine, the inverse function is just going to give me the argument of the first function. So it's just going to be theta critical is equal to the inverse sine of n2 over n1. And so that's how we can calculate the angle that gives us the maximum refraction of 90 degrees. For any incidence angle that's bigger than 90 degrees, or excuse me, any incidence angle that's bigger than the critical angle, you cannot have refraction. Since you can't have refraction, well, all of the light has to reflect. And so that's where we get the term total internal reflection. So in these pictures, this one here, theta 1 was less than the critical angle. Here, theta 1 was equal to the critical angle. And here, theta 1 was greater than the critical angle. Um, I put 2 instead of critical angle. And you can see the situations that occur. Total internal reflection, once you get to that critical angle or go to a bigger angle, it's all reflected inside. This is really useful to us. A lot of people have seen fiber optics. How does a fiber optic work? I'll show you. Pulling out my toys again. We are getting high speed internet in Lincoln, Nebraska. It's going to use fiber. I'm super excited because right now I have Time Warner, which is frankly not sufficient to the job. By that, you mean completely? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> of course, Windstream says we already offer high speed internet. There are around 2,000 people in the city that somehow miraculously can get it. Nobody knows where, they won't tell you, but. So here is a piece of plexiglass. You see the light goes through the plexiglass, right? Now I'm going to take this plexiglass, and if you look here, actually, yeah, there's a lot of light back there. It might be hard to see. Can, it, can everybody see this light right here? No, no? OK. Um, yeah, can you help me out, Joe? The back one is the one that makes it dark. Should be more visible now. Yes, also Joe and I don't know where we're going. <laughs> now it's a little annoying because you have all of the other light there that's messing you up. So let me just uh, block all the other light. What's going on with my little piece of plexiglass? The light goes in. Every time it hits a surface, it has total internal reflection. That's what fiber optics are. They're just little tubes of glass, and you have the light coming in such that the angle of incidence each time it hits the side is bigger than the critical angle, and so you have total internal reflection. So the light is just directed to follow that tube, the fiber optic, wherever it goes. Um, <clears throat> you, of course, have to have the right angles. If I go to a steeper angle, I eventually, eventually, okay, this here is apparently, I'm not going to actually get to it with the geometry of this, but if you hit it with an angle that's too close to parallel, then it will just come out here. But this thing being narrow, it's not going to work out for me to show that. So that's how a fiber optic works. It's using this total internal reflection to our advantage. Why is fiber optic good for communication, like to give me high speed internet at my home? Don't know. 
it's good for high speed internet because you're using optical frequencies. Frequencies in the order of 10 to the 14th hertz. When you're using really high frequencies, you can pack a lot more information in. And so the amount of information per second you can pass, roughly proportional to the frequency, if we're using our normal uh, wires, we can't get frequencies anywhere close to that 10 to the 14th hertz, so the amount of data we can put on the wires is not close to the amount of data we can put in the fibers because of the higher frequency. Okay, prisms. Prisms bend light because of refraction. But the index refraction is different for different colors. We've talked about that. So different colors bend by different amounts. So, so you have what we call dispersion. So in this picture, you see a diagram. Looking at these, which color has the highest speed in glass? Red is correct. Now... Was that a guess or did you have good reason? Uh, because it refracts the least. It refracts the least, and the refraction is, well, the sine theta of refraction is proportional to the index refraction. If the index refraction was 1, that means it'd be going the speed of light, and there would be no change because no change in speed. So if I had something that had the speed of light and it was the same as speed of light and air, it would have just gone straight. As the speed slows down, it starts bending. The more it slows, the more it bends. So we can look at this and we can say right away, N red is less than N yellow, is less than N blue, which means fastest to slowest. So just by looking at that, we can... We can tell. Now, a couple days ago, we had some really cool rainbows. Here's a picture of a really cool rainbow. When you look at this rainbow, do you see... Turn the lights off so maybe it stands out a little better. You see the rainbow down here. We call that the first order bow, the first order rainbow. And in that first order rainbow, what color is at the bottom? Okay, so we have blue at the bottom. And what color is at the top? Red. Now, if you look where I wrote the word red, how does that compare in brightness to where I wrote the word blue? Is it brighter here or brighter here? It's brighter where you have the blue. It's darker where you have the red. It's actually called Alexander's Dark Band, that darker region. Above the word red, what do you see? You should see something out there. Does everybody see that? What, what do you call that? Okay? Double rainbow. This first one, the inner one, is called, better write out here, is called the first order rainbow. This one out here is called the second order rainbow. And if you look at that, what color is at the bottom of this second order rainbow? Red. What color is at the top? So the color order is reversed in the second order rainbow compared to the first. Now this is all just looking at a picture. There's no explanation here as to why. It's just that's what we see. Well, an important thing in physics is always the why, right? The whole scientific process. What's the first step? Observe something interesting, like a rainbow. Second step. Remember, we do have the final exam on Monday. We need to know these. Okay. 
We have to develop a hypothesis that is based on scientific ideas that explains why the thing we observed happened and makes predictions that can be tested. So we have to come up with a hypothesis. Well, we're not going to go through that process. We're going to trust the people before us. The hypothesis is we know that rainbows occur when we have something close to rain, a lot of moisture in the air. So maybe it has to do with water droplets and the light going through it. We know that light has a different speed for different colors as it goes through the water droplets, so that could explain the separation of color. So there's a hypothesis. Well, then you have to have a test to test predictions of the hypothesis. Well, let's look at predictions of that hypothesis. Prediction number one. I can have white light that goes into a droplet of water shaped like a sphere, and that white light will have the colors separated. This only shows the red and the blue separated. All the other colors are going to come between those two. Comes back and reflects once off the back side. Now, because it reflected once, the red and the blue crossed over each other, and then they come out. But now if I look at this, the red light is a steeper angle. If I measure the angle from horizontal, so here's horizontal. Well, that's not a very good horizontal there. There's horizontal there. There's horizontal there. Which one of those two colors has the steeper angle? The red or the blue, which is the steeper angle? Mm, the red. The red has the bigger angle, the blue has the smaller angle. Now, since we're looking at this rainbow, we look at different angles and see the rainbow at different angles. So if I'm starting at the horizon and going up, which color am I going to come to first according to this, the prediction of this hypothesis? I'm going to come to the one that's the closest to horizontal, the smallest angle from horizontal, which color is that? The blue. So as I look up, I should see blue first because it's the closest to horizontal. Look up higher, the steeper angle, and then I'll see red. So this hypothesis says I should see blue below and then red above. And it actually gives an angle for it. It's in the ballpark of 40 degrees for these two. I don't remember the exact numbers, but it gives angles. And so we look at the picture of the rainbow, and the angle is measured from <laughs> the sun through your head. That's the line you measure from, and then you measure up from that. And so the rainbow actually is doing a circle. You can see it's doing a circle. It's doing a circle with the center of the sun as going from the sun through your head to the center of that rainbow. And then it's got roughly 40 degrees, I think, for the blue and 42 degrees for the red to make that first order rainbow. So that prediction of the hypothesis correctly explained the first order rainbow, its angles, and what the colors should be. Now the second order rainbow the hypothesis says, well, first order rainbow was one reflection. Second order rainbow will just go to how many reflections? How many reflections do you expect for the second order rainbow? Two, right, two. And so in this case, now you might wonder, how do they know the geometry for this? They know the geometry for this by simply calculating what incident angle will result in two reflections and then it comes out. Right? So they go through and they calculate what incident angle would give you one reflection and come out, what incident angle would give you two reflections and come out. And for two reflections, notice the light is actually going into the bottom part of the rainbow drop of the water droplet. It reflects twice, two reflections. So it crossed over once, but then it crossed over again. Now it comes out, and red is flatter, and blue is steeper. So that means if you start from the horizon and work up, you're going to get to the flatter one, so you're going to get to red first, 
and then you'll get to blue. And then when you look at the rainbow, that's exactly what we observed. So the predictions of the hypothesis turn out to be exactly what we observe. Does that prove it's correct? It doesn't prove it because you can't prove it correct. Fundamental of science, you can't prove it correct. But what does it do? It gives us more confidence. And you do more and more experiments and you get more and more confidence until at this point, I, I teach it like it's just a fact. Because to the best of our knowledge, it is true. Could turn out we have a flaw in our knowledge. Okay, now we're going to look at how lenses make images. So we've already looked at this in lab. The lens, if I have parallel rays, if it's thicker in the center and thinner at the edges, it's going to always make the light bend toward the center so it converges parallel rays. And we define the focal point as the point where incident parallel rays, parallel rays that are coming to the lens, all meet. So parallel rays form an image at the focal point, and we call the distance to the focal point the focal length. We give the symbol lowercase f for focal length, capital F for the focal point. And notice the focal point is drawn on both sides, excuse me again, it's drawn on both sides because light works the same way forward and backward. If I have parallel light coming from the right side, that parallel light rays coming from the right side would have then come together and formed an image at the focal point on the left side. We call converging lenses positive lenses because the focal length is positive. Because the light really comes together, we measure the distance out here to where it comes together and we get a positive number. So converging brings the light together. Has a positive focal length, so we call it a positive um, lens. Finding the image, you had to do this in lab, right? In lab, you had to construct a diagram like this. So you drew those three rays, the parallel ray, what well, we just saw, parallel light, comes into the lens and then refracts to go through the focal point. Using the ray nature of light, we just draw straight lines from the starting point to the lens, and then from the lens through the focal point and beyond. The second ray is called the focal ray. It goes through the, from the tip of my object through the near focal point. When it gets to the lens, it comes out parallel because parallel rays go through the focal point, so if it went through the focal point, it had to come out parallel because it does the same forward and backward. The third ray is to check to make sure we were, didn't make a mistake in the first two. If we drew the first two perfectly correct, the third one would always match it. So we do the third one just as a double check. And the third one we call the vertex ray. It just goes from tip of the object through the very center of our lens, keeps going straight. Why straight? Because at the center of our lens, we have parallel sides. And so it's just going through parallel sides, the net change in angle is zero. That's how we draw it. Now, we get our equation here, one over the distance object, O in our textbook is used for distance object, plus one over distance image is one over the focal length. How does that come about? It comes about by looking at the geometry of the triangles that are made in this diagram. We're not going through the geometry to show that that equation is correct. But that equation allows us to carefully calculate the image distance from the object distance if I know the focal length. It's actually called the thin lens equation. It's called thin lens because it assumes that the lens is so thin that nothing special happens inside of the lens. Light comes in and X is from the same height is the thin lens approximation. Oh, yes, a couple things to point out here. The image is inverted here. 
It started out upright. By convention, we always put our image to the left of our lens and upright, with the base of it on what we call the principal axis. The line that goes through the vertex, the center of the lens, and is perpendicular to the, uh, or the, um, the long <laughs> direction in the lens. So this is the principal axis that's dashed. And we put the base of our object on the principal axis. We use the three rays on the tip of the object. And then we find our image by going from where the three rays converge back to the principal axis. So this is inverted. Is this a real or a virtual image? Real, he says. Why do you say real? Um, because that's where the light actually converges. Yeah. The light rays actually hit there. If they actually meet there, then it's real. If they don't actually meet and it's just the projection of what we see, then it was, would have been virtual. Here is an example, once again, using the same lens. What's different now is the object is placed closer than the focal point. With the object closer than the focal point, you see the parallel ray refracts to go through the focal point, just like it's supposed to. The vertex ray starts from the tip of the candle, goes right through the vertex and keeps going. But if you look at just those two rays, you see that they are moving away from each other. They're never going to meet, which means we're not going to have a real image, because a real image, they have to really meet. So we just take and we pro project backward and say where well, our eyeball would say it looked like these rays met back here. So what kind of image do we call this? A virtual. Why virtual? Somebody side time because he's answered most of my questions today. Why do we call it virtual? It's not really there. The rays didn't really meet there. But when we look through the lens, it looks like they're there. So in lab on Monday, when you couldn't find the real image, you looked back through it to see the virtual image. Is this virtual image upright or inverted? And of course, it says the word upright, but you should be able to see, yes, it's pointing the same direction as the object was. That makes it upright. Okay, this is not a clicker question. This is just to work out the problem. An object two centimeters in height lies 10 centimeters to the left of a positive lens. What does it mean to be a positive lens? Converging. With a focal length of 20 centimeters. Where is the image and what is its magnification? So how am I going to solve this? I could do it graphically, but I can also use, and I'm going to use, I'm just a lot more comfortable using DI instead of I. There's our thin lens equation. I know that the object is 2 centimeters in height and lies 10 centimeters to the left. So that gives me my distance object. And the focal length is 20 centimeters, so that gives me my F. So I know two numbers. Let's just put them in. 1 over distance image, well, first of all, is 1 over focal length minus 1 over distance object, just moving distance object to the other side. Putting the numbers, 1 over 20 centimeters minus 1 over 10 centimeters. 1 over 10 is 2 over 20. 1 over 20 minus 2 over 20. What's 1 minus 2? It's a really, really tough one. It's minus 1 over 20 centimeters. So what is the distance image? Minus 20 centimeters. I haven't used a distance of a negative yet. That negative means it's not on the direction that the light traveled after going through the lens. It's on the opposite side. So it's 20 centimeters before the lens. Now this had a second part. It said, what's the magnification? 
Do you remember the definition of magnification from Monday? Okay, take that as a note because we're out of time. It's the height of the image divided by the height of the object. Well, in this case, that's, oh, and that's always minus distance image over distance object. So in this case, that's going to be minus parentheses, minus 20 centimeters over 10 centimeters. Minus a negative 20 is a positive 20, right? 20 divided by 10 is 2 equals 2. So the magnification is 2. That is, the image is twice as tall as the object. And it came out to be a positive magnification because it's upright. A negative magnification is inverted. Okay, we're out of time. I uh, will see you Friday for a review lecture.